Okay, let's see how to fit and predict multiple variable linear models in Python. Now we saw in the previous section that you can compute the solutions through some linear equations. But once you have a sufficiently large number of data points, you don't want to generally solve those equations by hand, and you almost always do these on a computer program like Python. So to illustrate this, we're going to go back to the demo that we started uh, right in our motivating example. And you can go back to that Colab research website here. And when you do this, after you run the first few initial cells, you can continue by scrolling to this section on improvements with multiple variable linear models. There's actually a section which tries out fitting models one variable at a time. You can do that one on your own. Okay, so the first thing you want to do when you're trying to fit the data is that you want to split the data into training and test. We're going to talk about this in the next unit in detail, but the short reason is that you, when you try to evaluate the quality of the model, you want to test it on new data that wasn't used in training. So what I'm going to do is just designate 300 samples for training and then the remaining samples for test. Since there are 442 total samples, that will leave 142 for test. Again, we'll talk about this training and test split in detail. Once you allocate, once you decide the number of training and test samples, you can get the first 300 rows of the data matrix through this Python um, syntax, and then also get the corresponding 300 elements of the target. And we'll put that into X train and Y train. And let's just run that cell. Now, after you have the training data, it's super easy in sklearn to fit the model. Basically, you just do this. First, you construct a linear regression object, which is shown here in this first line, all right? And then all you do is simply call the fit routine with the training data and labels. And this works super fast and it tells you that it's done. Now at this point, the coefficients in the model are not actually output from this function, but they're stored as member variables in the class. And you can just get them if you wanted to directly like this. The intercept is shown here and the coefficients are in this um, field like this, dot coef underscore. Now, you could use the coefficient and intercept to make predictions about new data, but we're just we're actually going to use a built-in function for this purpose. So if we wanted to find out what the values of y that it would have predicted on the training data, I just call this method here, which is regression.predict, with the data variables for that model, and then it gives you the predicted value. We can also compute the normalized RSS, which is the mean of the uh, mean squared error divided by the standard deviation, and also the R squared value here. Okay, and if you run this cell, it tells you that the R squared value is, on the training data is 0.51, so in other words, about 51% of the variation in the glucose level can be explained on the training data with these 10 variables. We could also plot a scatter plot of the true values and versus the predicted values, which I can just do with this scatter command here. And I've also plotted this red line here. Since this is the actual and this is the predicted, if the model were exact, all the samples would line up exactly on this red line. You can see that the red line captures the general trend, but there are some variations. And that's simply because the model can't explain all the possible variations in glucose level. That's what you would imagine in any biological data set like this, because there are so many factors that go into um, the variability of glucose no 10 variables like this are going to be able to capture it entirely. Now, I mentioned earlier that 
you want to split the data into training and test. And the reason is that you actually don't want to evaluate the data on the training data, that that is the data you use to fit it, but you want to evaluate it on new data that wasn't used in the part of the training. Again, we'll talk about this in detail in the next unit. So I'm just going to repeat that evaluation on the test data that we didn't have used in training. For this purpose, we can get the test data by grabbing all the samples after 300, which is just with this Python syntax here for both the um, data and the targets, and then run the predictions of the model on the test. We can then compute the RSS and the R squared and run it. And we get actually here about the same value. So again, about 51% of the variation is explained um, in, on the test data by these 10 model variables. We can also do the same plot as before of the prediction versus the actual values. And again, you see that uh, it captures some of the trend, but not all of it. Let me just wrap up with uh, how to solve those coefficients manually. By manually, I mean the following. What we used up above was using sklearn's built-in package for the linear regression. I would suggest to always use this, but just so that you understand what's happening under the hood, so to speak, it's useful to just know how, what, how to compute these by hand. So to do this, remember the first part in solving the equations is to create that feature matrix, which has a ones on the first column and then the matrix X in the remaining columns. You can do that in Python with this syntax where we create a ones vector and then we stack it with the training matrix. When you do this, you'll see that the shape of the matrix you get is 300 by 11. 300 because there are 300 training samples and there's one ones column plus 10 features, so there's 11 columns total. Now, to once you have the A matrix, we want to do the least square solution for Y equals A times beta. You can do this with this command here in Python, which you call this least squares function. This actually has several outputs, so you have to grab the first one, which will be your values beta. If you want, and now we can pr print the beta solution here. And when you print it, you see that you get the 11 coefficients. You can compare these coefficients with the values that you got using the Python package, and they're the same. For example, the last 10 coefficients you get are the same that you had from the regression model. You can see here, for example, it's minus 16.5, minus 254, and so on, and that matches up. And the intercept as well, 152, matches with this intercept here. Now, just a little bit about this function here. If you recall, the equation to get this was this A transpose A time inverse times A transpose Y. You could compute that directly in Python using this syntax here. There's a built-in function for computing matrix inverses, uh, elements to compute transposes, and so on. And if you run this, you would get the same thing as that we had above here. But in general, I do not suggest that you ever write it like this. In this case, it's fine because the data set is so small. But once you have a larger data set, you would have, this would be much, much slower than doing this. In this uh, version, it actually computes this A transpose A and the inverse. But there's actually a mathematically faster way to directly get this answer without doing either of those two steps. If you take a numerical methods class, and there are some excellent ones at NYU, they'll talk about these and many other numerical methods. I won't have the time in this class to go into it, but just to let you know that generally try to avoid doing this type of calculation this way um, when possible. All right, now that you're done um, with this uh, simple demo, before you go on, just try to do this simple exercise here just to make sure that you understand some basic points. And all this exercise is is just repeating the same types of computations on a very simple toy data example 
with a few samples.